many of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves. This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. Superhumans, Boomer Anderson here, back with another episode of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. Today, we're covering a topic that needs to be talked about more widely. And it's something that when I say the topic, you may say, hey, Boomer, that's not very superhuman. Yes, you're right. Binging is not very superhuman. And we're talking about binging on foods here. But with the United States and other countries approaching close to a greater than 50% overweight population, binging is something that needs to be talked about. And my guest today is an expert on the subject, and he's developed a very simple, actionable, and tactical book which can enable you to stop binging starting today. My guest today is Dr. Glenn Livingston. He's a veteran psychologist, and he was the longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. We get into what that was like. Delusion by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or obese individuals. Remember that whole philosophy of love yourself thin? Well, we talk about why that's not exactly true. Dr. Livingston spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating with his own patients, but also a self-funded research project with, which had over 40,000 participants. And finally, we get into Dr. Livingston's own journey out of obesity and food prison into a normal healthy weight, and he actually looks very healthy when you see him. So what do we get into in this podcast? So we talked a little bit about what is binging. We talked about the neurological components of binging and the different aspects of the brain that are involved. We talk about a food plan, and we're not talking about meal planning here, where you're mapping out really what you eat on a day-to-day basis, although that is very, very helpful. We talk about really how to construct algorithms that you can use in your everyday life to reduce decision fatigue and help you make smarter decisions, whether you're at Starbucks, as we talk about, or at the Krispy Kreme, frankly, you should never go there, or at some other place. And finally, I got to pick his brain on measurement because I have a view on measurement that measurement and things that we measure get managed, as Lord Kelvin would say. Things that we measure get better. And we address the concept of measuring your weight every day. And Dr. Livingston has a very unique approach to this. So if you want to check out the show notes on this one, which are filled with references, as well as a link to a free book from Dr. Livingston, go to decodingsuperhuman.com slash Glenn. That's G-L-E-N-N. Superhumans, enjoy my episode with Dr. Glenn Livingston. The sponsor for today's podcast is Neurohacker Collective. The chairman, Jordan Greenhall, has been on the show to talk about one of my favorite topics and episodes to date, sovereignty. And the medical director has also been on the show to talk about unleashing your human potential through epigenetics. That's Dr. Daniel Stickler. But why do I love Neurohacker Collective so much? Well, frankly, it upgrades me on a day-to-day basis. Actually, I take their products five out of seven days of the week. Their original Qualia stack is something that I absolutely and still thoroughly enjoy. It's packed with over 40 premium brain nutrients to immediately enhance your focus, energy, mood, creativity, and all while supporting your health. Their new flagship nootropic, Qualia Mind, is a premium nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and brain health. And frankly, with both products, I do not get the crashes that I commonly get with nootropics and other supplements. So I want you to go over to their website and check it out when you have a chance. It's neurohacker.com. And if you subscribe, you get 15% off by using the code BOOMER. If you want to just do a one-time purchase, you get 10% off, again, using that code BOOMER. And while you're there, pick up their free foundational guide to neurohacking. It's definitely worth checking out. But please, enjoy the show. Dr. Livingston, thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to it, Boomer, and you can call me Glenn. (laughs) Glenn, well, this is going to be an absolute pleasure because this is a topic that people all over the world have issues with. And I know some of my clients do as well, but also I think it's a a topic that people kind of push under the rug and say, you know, maybe it's in my genes, 
But let's let's start by defining terms because you wrote this great book. And do you mind just defining for us what is binging in the traditional sense? Well, in the traditional sense, in the DSM five, it's a uh, recurrent and persistent episodes of binging, which are eating much more rapidly than normal and eating until you're uncomfortably full or having a lot of food when you're not physically hungry or eating alone because you're embarrassed by how much you're eating or feeling disgusted with yourself and depressed or really guilty after overeating. And there is marked distress that goes along with this and there is absence of compensatory behavior like purging. So that's that's the formal definition of binging. And I mean, you could look that up online and you know read it off if they want to. But really what I'm addressing is the sense that people get that they can't stop, that they're eating beyond their own best judgment, that they laid out a plan for themselves when they were of sound mind and body and strategically thinking about how they wanted to be with food and what they wanted to accomplish with their health and fitness. And then on Monday morning, they're at Starbucks and you know there's a big hairy chocolate bar at the counter saying, eat me, and your whole diet plan goes out the, goes out the window. So that's that's really why I wrote the book. It was not necessarily just to treat a formal eating disorder, though I certainly had one. I certainly had one myself. So, Do you mind sharing which one that was? Well, I, I had what you would call exercise bulimia. Mm-hmm. So I, that means I, I couldn't throw up but because I couldn't stick my finger down my throat. But I figured out that if I worked out for three hours a day, that I could eat whatever I wanted to. Mm-hmm. So, and that was me when I was, you know, 17, 18 years old. But when I got to graduate school at 22, when I was married and I had patients and a two hour commute, I could work out maybe three half hours per week and much less three hours a day. But I kept on thinking about food and eating food in the same way. And I just gained weight and gained weight and gained weight. And I, I got to be about 260 was about the last weigh in that I had, but it was probably more like 280 because I didn't weigh myself the whole time. And um, my triglycerides were through the roof. I had readings that were 10 times the normal amount, and the doctors were telling me that I was going to die by the time I hit 30 or 35 if I didn't stop. A lot of cardiovascular risk in my family. And um, it was miserable, not, not only because of how I was feeling physically, but I come from a family of psychologists, and it's the most important thing in the world to me, I think, is to be a really good psychologist. But I couldn't be present with people. See, be, being a great psychologist is not really just an intellectual job. It's you have to lend people your soul. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you, you've you got to be where, there with them. But if I was sitting with a suicidal person and thinking about, well, when can I get a whole pizza? I couldn't be 100% presence with them. And thankfully, I never lost anyone, but I just felt like I wasn't doing my job and it was it was miserable. So I could tell you the rest of the story and how I recovered if you want me to, or if you want to go someplace else, we could do it. I would actually love to hear how you recovered and how that kind of led to the development of this book. Okay. Um, I was never going to publish this book, by the way. This was a journal that I kept. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. I tried everything that I could to love myself thin. I'm a, you know, from a family of psychologists, you could imagine that I took the psychological approach because if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I went to the best psychologist. I explored my childhood. I tried to figure out what was the hole in my heart that was causing me to eat. I went to Overeaters Anonymous for several years. I took medication, did everything you could think of psychologically to address this. And it was a very rich and soulful journey. I don't regret having done that. And I learned a lot about myself and I developed some relationship skills I wouldn't have had otherwise. But I would get a little better and then I get a lot worse, a little better, a lot worse. And it just wasn't working. Somewhere along the line, I got the idea that I would do a study for myself because I, I don't have children and I never commuted. So I had a lot of time to work on my career. And since, since I was doing all this consulting, I did millions of dollars of consulting for, uh, in advertising research for large companies, a lot of them in the food industry. I decided I was going to conduct one for myself. Since they were paying me so much money to do these studies, I thought they must be valuable. I'll do one for myself. And I got 40,000 people over the course of about five years, back when the internet clicks were cheap, to take a survey. And in that survey, I asked them, what foods do you struggle with once you start eating them? I mean, what foods can't you stop eating? Mm-hmm. What areas of your life are you stressed in? What areas of your life you're happy in? And then I asked a whole bunch of personality variables. And 
I looked for correlations and I found three interesting things. People who struggled with uh, chocolate, if that was their primary addiction, that was my primary addiction. That's how everything always started. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like pizza and pasta and all that stuff also, but it was always chocolate that started it. They tended to be lonely or brokenhearted. And people who struggled with soft, chewy things like bagels and pasta and bread tended to be stressed at home. And people who struggled with salty, crunchy things like chips and pretzels, they tended to be stressed at work. And I thought this was really interesting. And I figured then if you knew what you were struggling with, then you'd know what the issues were. I thought I was one step closer to solving it. So I went back and I asked my mom, who's also a psychotherapist and also a chocoholic. And I said, mom, why do you think in my history, what is it that set me up to look for chocolate when I was feeling lonely or brokenhearted? I mean, obviously now I'm in a bad marriage and got all these other struggles. So it makes sense that, you know, this connection is there, but how did it start? And mom gets this horrible look on her face. She says, honey, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. But when you were a little boy, maybe one or two years old, my father, your grandfather just got out of prison and he was guilty. And I didn't know he was doing these things and I'd idolized him my whole life. And I just felt like the rug was pulled out from under me. And I was quite frankly, very depressed. And at the same time, your dad, my husband, was a captain in the army and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam. So I was terrified I was gonna be a single mother with another one on the way. And I was horribly depressed about my, my father. And you would come running to me looking for food or a hug or just some love and company. And I put a refrigerator on the floor and I put a big bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup in there. And I said, honey, go get your Bosco. And you'd go running to the chocolate syrup and you'd suck on it and go into a chocolate sugar coma. So Boomer, if, if this were the movies, mom and I would have a big hug and a big cry and I would never struggle with chocolate again, right? It sounds like a romance flick, yeah. <laughs> yes. But we, um, we had a hug and, and a metaphorical cry. This is over Skype. And I forgave her. Like it, it was, a, it was a, an important conversation. It brought me closer to my mom. I forgave myself. So it was, it was a soulful thing to do, but my chocolate problem got worse. And this was paradigm shifting for me. The reason it got worse was because there was this crazy voice in my head. And the voice said something like, hey, Glenn, you know what? You're right. Your mama didn't love you enough and she left a big chocolate sized hole in your heart. And until you can find the love of your life, you're gonna to have to go right on binging, yippee, let's go get some. And what I realized from that was that maybe the problem wasn't in why. Maybe why was not gonna solve the problem. Maybe it didn't matter why, because there it was in black and white. I don't think you could know any more clearly why I struggled with chocolate. Maybe the problem was with this crazy voice in my head that justified things. Mm -hmm. and, and how could I recognize and disempower it? Simultaneously, two other things were happening. I was coming out of Overeaters Anonymous, so I was reading a lot of alternative addiction recovery literature. And I came across a guy named Jack Trimpey from Rational Recovery. He works with drugs and alcohol, which I like to call the black and white addictions. These are things you can quit entirely, as opposed to food, which you have to take the lion out of the cage and walk it around the block a couple of times a day. And what he said was that the seat of addiction was in the reptilian brain. It's the part of the brain all the way back here. Ooh, let's, go, let's go into this. I like this part. Yeah. And the reptilian brain in neurology, it assists things in the environment in a very unique way, none of which have to do with love. The reptilian brain looks at something in the environment and says, do I eat it? Do I mate with it? Or do I kill it? It's eat, mate, or kill. Love is it something we associate with more of the mammalian brain, the part of our brain that says, well, if you think of the, this is the brain stem, that's the reptilian brain, then the mammalian brain's on top of that, and then the, the human brain, the neocortex on top of that. And whether evolution put it there or God put it there doesn't really matter, that's how it's wired. And the mammalian brain says, well, hold on a second, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact is this going to have on my family and my loved ones and my tribe? So that's the beginnings of love. And then in the human brain, there are more esoteric concepts like spirituality and art and music and long-term relationships and also long-term thinking and strategic goals and delay of gratification and dieting and health and fitness goals. That's all in the human brain. And the last thing that was happening was I was doing a lot of consulting for big food. And I knew that they were engineering these 
hyperpalatable food-like substances, which were concentrations of fat and sugar and starch and oil and excitotoxins that are engineered to hit your bliss point without giving you enough nutrition to make you feel satisfied. So you go back for more and more and more. When I looked at the animal studies, because I, I said, well, what they're really doing is short circuiting our pleasure mechanism. Like evolution gave us a pleasure mechanism so that we would you know, pay attention to the apple, we would pay attention to the blueberries or, or you know, maybe to the lean meat if that's what your, your beliefs are. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't give us these pleasure systems so that we would pay attention to chips and pasta and chocolate bars. I'm not saying that they're inherently evil or anything like that and a lot of people like to enjoy them, but we didn't have them on the savanna. This is a, it's a supersized stimulus that's short circuiting our pleasure system. Glenn, just real quick on the pleasure system, are we referring to just dopamine here or are we re referring to other aspects as well? Well, it's not necessarily my expertise, but I, I believe it's dopamine and, and serotonin. And there's a couple of other chemicals that go through the cingulate gyrus. Okay. It, it doesn't matter so much. It, it matters more that this is the way that it works. Mm -hmm. And and when you look at what happens to mammals, if you short circuit their pleasure systems, for example, there's a bunch of studies in the 50s and 60s where they put electrodes directly into the, into the pleasure center in the brain, and then they allow the animals to self-stimulate by pressing a lever. It turns out those animals then want to press that lever above everything else. Like thousands of times per day, that's all they do. A starving rat will literally starve to death, pushing the button thousands of times a day and ignoring its food. A nursing mother rat will ignore its pups and press the lever thousands of times per day. The result of short-circuiting the evolutionary pleasure system in mammals is the abandonment of the survival drive. It's almost like the survival drive has been hijacked. Now, I don't think anybody's putting electrodes in our brains. I'm not that crazy. Although when you hear the rest of how I recovered, you might, um, you might disagree. But, <laughs> but, but, when you walk out of a Burger King and across the street there's a McDonald's, I don't think we're that far away from saying their pleasure buttons are all around us. And I don't think we're that far away from ignoring our survival drives. How many people like vegetables anymore? How many people really like fruit anymore? People's pleasure systems have been redirected and hijacked towards all these industrial products and everybody's looking for love at the bottom of a bag or a box or a container. I said, okay, that's what's it. So you put this all together. Why does it matter so much? What, what happened to strike the, the match originally doesn't matter. What matters is that there's a raging fire. And once these foods are in your system past a certain point, they have a life of their own. They're kind of like a drug. And, and you want to ignore your survival drives and you feel like it's a matter of life and death that you get the chocolate. And that's why we have jokes that just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. I mean, people really feel like that with every bone of their body. And, and I also realized from Jack Trimpey's work that since the reptilian brain doesn't know love and since it's situated in such a way as to be inferior to our human brains and our mammalian brains, that I wasn't really dealing with a situation where I wanted to nurture my inner wounded child back to health. What I was dealing with was the necessity to control a bodily organ. It's kind of like your bladder or your testicles. Like if you see an attractive person in the street, you can't just run out and kiss them or you're going to get in a lot of trouble. But you have this organ that generates a very powerful biological urge and you have to restrain and sublimate and express it in a particular way at a particular time. Same with your bladder. If you're in your mother-in-law's living room and you really gotta go, you have to excuse yourself and go to the bathroom. You just can't be on the floor. It's, 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 a, it's a piece of you, but it's not you. It's no more you than your bladder is you. What it is is a game of ruthless domination. It's, um, it's kind of like an alpha wolf being challenged for leadership by another member of the pack. When an alpha wolf is challenged for leadership by another member of the pack, it doesn't say, oh, somebody needs a hug. You know, come here, let's, let's snuggle. It says, get back in line or I'll kill you. And then there's, you know, there's a very serious fight that ensues if the challenger keeps on going. So I said, this is what I have to figure out. How do I dominate this thing, not how do I love this thing? And that was a real paradigm shift for me. So here's what I did, and here's the embarrassing part. As a sophisticated psychologist with, you know, almost 30 years of experience, I guess it was 25 at that time. I said, okay, I'm going to call my reptilian brain my inner pig. 
and I'm going to draw very clear bright lines that differentiate healthy food behavior from unhealthy food behavior. So for example, I will only ever eat chocolate again on Saturdays. And if I heard my pig squealing for chocolate on anything but a Saturday by saying something like, oh, you've exercised enough and you've earned it, or it doesn't matter, you could start tomorrow, or chocolate comes from a cocoa bean which grows on a plant and therefore it's a vegetable, whatever, <laughs> whatever the pig was squealing about, I'd say, I don't want that my pig does. My pig is squealing for pig slop. I don't eat pig slop and I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And as crude and primitive and ridiculous as that sounds, what happened was, it's like it woke me up. And at the moment of impulse, I had these extra microseconds to remember who I was, what my goals were, and how I could conduct myself if I chose to with food. And it wasn't a miracle. It wasn't like I was immediately cured, but I was immediately empowered. I'd gotten to the point where I'd felt powerless and unable to resist. And I was going to all these groups that told me I was powerless. But all of a sudden I said, no, I do have the power. That's ridiculous. I can do this. And once I realized I had the choice, I started to make the choice. And I experimented with some of the rules. I kept a journal for years and years of me versus my pig, all the crazy things my pig said. I was not going to publish it. I was part of a minor publishing company that asked me for a book. I was getting divorced. And I said, OK, I'll do it. I took the summer and edited it into the book. And um, now we have 600,000 readers and 700 reviews, and it's helping a crazy number of people. So I don't need pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. That's my claim to fame. What can I say? Beautiful. And I like the analogy because it helps people really sort of imagine how easy this can be. I mean, it's difficult in the sense that you have to fight the pig on a daily basis, but it can be easy. Now, in the book, you mentioned something about creating these menus, and I guess I would go as far as say algorithms as to when you eat certain things. Do you mind walking through how people can do that themselves and just maybe give them a few tips if they are binging? Yeah. Um, well, if you are binging, I would suggest you step back and consider what's your single most significant trigger food or trouble behavior. So for some people like me, that might have been chocolate. And you could say, you're never going to have chocolate except for Saturdays again. Maybe you're never going to have it again. We'll talk about the word never later on because people are afraid of that word and they don't have to be. Or maybe it would be, I will never eat in the car again, or I'll never go back for seconds again, or I'll never buy food from a drive through again, or I'll never eat standing up again, or I'll always put my fork down between bites, or uh, I will never eat in front of the television again, whatever it is. Pick one rule like that and then declare yourself confident clear yourself 100% confidence so you can purge all that doubt and insecurity from your mind. And then just listen for what your inner food monster, your inner pig, whatever you want to call it, for what the reptilian brain says to try to talk you out of it. The key to this is to recognize that we are of two minds, and that's okay. There's your upper brain and there's your lower brain. There's you and then there's the pig. And you don't have to be frightened of it because you have the power. What you have to do is recognize what the pig is saying. You need to understand that the pig is up to no good. All it, all it really wants is to get you to break the rules. And then you can either ignore it or you can expose its faulty logic. So for example, maybe the pig says, you've worked out really hard and you could start abstaining from chocolate tomorrow. It's not gonna make a difference. You're gonna weigh the same thing. Well, the problem with that logic is that the principles of neurology, neuroplasticity in particular, say that we are either always reinforcing or extinguishing our behaviors. So if you eat chocolate today, it's going to be harder for you not to eat chocolate tomorrow because you will have reinforced that pattern. So it does make a difference. It does hurt. And that would be an example of exposing the logic so that you can ignore the, ignore the pig. Um, and then there are a variety of other types of rules that I found can work. So there are the never rules, like I'll never have chocolate again. There are conditional rules, like I'll only ever have chocolate at a social occasion or on the last Saturday of the month or on Saturdays, whatever you want to do. Then there are always rules, like I will always have five, fruit, five servings of fruits and vegetables every day before lunch. Or I will always write down a hypothetical food plan for the day just so I can spot the trouble spots. And then I also recommend people think about an unrestricted category so that they know that they're not going to starve. Like, what, what is it that you can always eat or drink 
if you need to, just so you know there's always something available. And, and this is just my suggested way for creating a food plan for yourself. I don't tell people what to eat or how to eat. I leave that up to them. I think that by the time someone's an adult and has tried a whole bunch of different diets, they have a good idea what a healthy day looks like and what an unhealthy day looks like. And the job of this book, my job with them, is to help them to define it really clearly in black and white in, in language and then use that language to stick to the stick to the plan. So Glenn, I love this because it gives us really some really actionable and quite easy ways to categorize different foods, right? So you have, if I'm just myself even, I can have my always foods or even the unrestrained foods, which may be something like cauliflower, or I'm picturing water for myself, but you can have your always foods, you can have your sometimes foods, and then for me, the never foods would be something like beer, just because it's a it's a quicksand food for me. But this is really, really helpful and useful that if people can just, I mean, frankly, if you wanted to do this at home, you just get out a spreadsheet or grid it on a piece of paper, and you can start writing these little, these little guides for themselves. Yeah. And at the end of the call, I'll, we have a set of food plan starter templates for just about any dietary philosophy. So whether you're paleo or, um, or you know, keto or vegan or high carb or low carb, it doesn't matter. There, there's a way to get started. Beautiful. So in the book, you mentioned that there are certain times where you can actually change this plan. So picture I've built out this grid of always, sometimes, never, and the un restrained foods. When do you change? When is it appropriate to change those foods? Well, it's rare that people get their food plan right the first try. And we use words like never and always because it turns out the reptilian brain acts like a two-year-old. And you, t you use never and always with two-year-olds to keep them safe. Little Sarah, you can never, ever, ever, ever cross the street without holding my hand. Never, ever, ever, ever. We don't tell them, well, when you're a big girl, you're going to learn how to look both ways and maybe I'll teach you then because that will get them to entertain thoughts that are too dangerous for them at two years old. You want them to really see it as never. And so we present our food rules to our food demon, to our pigs, as if they were set in stone forever. However, it would be silly to think that we shouldn't have the opportunity to change and evolve our plan as we accumulated knowledge, experience, and wisdom. So for example, I remember the nutritional state of knowledge maybe about 15 years ago suggested that if you had nuts with your dried fruit, that it actually slowed down the glycemic uptake of the dried fruit. And then there, and then there was new research that came out more recently that said, no, 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 it speeds it up. And at the time, I'd had a rule that I always had to have nuts with dried fruit if I was going to eat dried fruit. But it would be silly for me to ignore that research. What I like to do is tell people that they shouldn't change the plan impulsively. They should always have a 24 to 48 hour delay between the time that they sit down for a half an hour or so, analyze the particular change that they want to make, and the time that that change takes effect. What that does is it removes the potential immediate reward to the pig for suggesting XYZ change. And it it shifts the responsibility for changing the plan from your emotions and impulses to your intellect. And that's really the goal of Never Binge Again is to have you make intellectual decisions about food that are devoid of emotions and illogical thought processes. Mm -hmm. So can we just walk through a typical scenario here? Because uh, one of the ways I find that people get themselves in trouble, so to speak, when it comes to following any nutrition plan is they will slip, fall, maybe have that piece of chocolate when they're not supposed to. So I guess walking through a scenario like that, where let's say XYZ person is going to the refrigerator, opens the refrigerator, gets that mouth stimulus, that saliva buildup, and they want to eat that chocolate what is the appropriate conversation or the appropriate actions that the person should take at that given time in order to avoid what is potentially a reinforcing feedback loop? Okay. So what you need to understand is that if that's happening in the context of having made a decision that that's against your food plan, because I don't want to say that that behavior is unhealthy for any reason if it was on your plan, but, but if you decided that that's not on your plan, 
what that means is that your, your biological machinery has taken over and they've put you into a kind of fight or flight mode. You say, forget, it says, forget all of your intellectual plans and your best laid thinking. This is an emergency. We need that chocolate or we need whatever's in the refrigerator. And so the first thing you can do is something that will activate the part of the nervous system that takes you out of fight or flight. So if you take a deep breath and you tense all your muscles as hard as you possibly can, and then you breathe out, and you do that three times, that will activate, I think it's the parasympathetic nervous system that takes you out of the fight or flight mode. And it'll slow you down and help you remember who you are and who you want it to be. And then ask yourself, how am I going to feel 30 minutes after I do this? And if you really, really want to do that, then it's up to you after that. But that'll take you out of the fight or flight mode. I also would like you to say at that point that, well, this is pig slop and my and pig wants that I don't. As silly as it sounds, because by, by disclaiming the desire and projecting it onto this you know, bodily organ, this is almost like an external entity, you are committing to developing a success identity. You're saying that you're going to actively collect evidence that you don't want this and your pig does. You're going to shun the desire for it at this particular time in this particular way because you decided that that's not who you want to be and your personality starts to develop around that and more and more it will feel more natural for you to to avoid that so those are the things that you can do to take yourself out of what feels like automaton mode and remember what your plans are and act accordingly if you happen to go further if you happen to make a mistake then what's very important is to recognize the role of guilt and shame because people get very confused about this and it's a little more complicated than it's made out to be often people think that they shouldn't feel any guilt or shame about making a mistake like that but guilt and shame are the psychological core correlates of physical pain in our body and there is a function to physical pain in the body if a child is born without the ability to feel pain and there are children with disorders like this they rarely can live more than four or five years. And the reason is they can't learn how to stop hurting themselves. They have to be constantly protected. They have to wear football hel helmets. It's really a very distressing disorder. However, once you feel the pain, like let's say you touch a hot stove, you want to feel that pain for a second, but you don't want to perseverate on that pain. You don't want to say, oh my God, I'm a pathetic hot stove toucher. I might as well throw the rest of my hand down on the stove and just leave it there. What, what you want to do is figure out how did you miss the stove? Why did you make that mistake? How are you going to adjust going forward? Once the pain has served the function of getting your attention to shift your plans, and in this scenario, it could be that you have to change your rule a little bit, or maybe you didn't attend to your blood sugar during the course of the day. Maybe you got yourself get overwhelmed. You didn't have enough food. Once you've figured that all out, then you have to let it go. Because it turns out that the desire to castigate yourself and yell at yourself and criticize yourself to an excessive amount after you made a mistake, it's actually coming from your, your reptilian brain. It's binge motivated. What it's trying to do, your pig is trying to get you to feel too weak to resist the next binge. And so it's very critical to forgive yourself with dignity at that point. I always say we want to commit with perfection because the nature of a commitment is a perfect commitment. We don't say, you know, uh, gee, honey, I know we're getting married and I'm pretty sure that I can resist all those other women out there, but I'm sure I have a lot of attractive people out there and I don't want to lie. So progress, not perfection, right? There are, there, the nature of some commitments is that they have to be perfect. Winners visualize themselves winning the race before they even start because with that perfect commitment, you can purge your mind of doubt and distraction. And the doubt and distraction wears down your energy so you can't accomplish the goal. But when you've made a mistake and you felt the pain for a little bit, in order to recover your energy and not get, get it worn down by self-castigation, you have to forgive yourself with dignity. So commit with perfection, forgive yourself with dignity, get up and shoot at the target again. And this is why in the book you say, I think I can is the wrong philosophy, right? Yes. Yes, I think I can means maybe I also think that I can't. Uh, progress, not perfection, as a 
as a commitment tool just means I'm going to try for a little while until I don't feel like it anymore. I know I can is the, it's the only way to really make a commitment. You, you need to embrace confidence. You need to decide that this is who you are now. I have become a person who only eats chocolate on Saturdays. It's a decision of character. That's very important because character trumps willpower. I'll give you, may I give you an example? I know that I'm talking a lot. Uh, no, I, I love that phrase, character trumps willpower. I'd love to hear more about it. So everybody is already doing this. Everybody already knows this. They just don't know that they know it. If you walk into a diner and there's a $10 bill on the table because the waitress hasn't seen her tip and she says, hey, I'll be right back. I just have to get your menus. And there's no video camera and there's no window up front and there's nobody there who would see you take it. Well, Boomer, would you take that $10 bill? No. But that's, that's, it's more just my, how it's not mine. So why would I take it? Because you're not a thief. Exactly. Yeah. So as a matter of character, you've defined a rule for yourself without knowing it about how to handle a particular temptation every time, even if no one would see you do otherwise. It doesn't take any willpower not to take that because there's no decision. It's not even an option. It's just not the kind of person that you are. That's, what, that's the kind of commitment that I'm talking about. I'm talking about becoming a certain type of person around food so that your character can trump willpower. It's very important because what we know about willpower is that it's not a genetic gift. It's not like a on-off switch that some people have and some people don't. It's, it's more like gas in the tank and that gas is worn down by decision making. Not just food decisions, people have trouble resisting marshmallows if you make them do math problems before. It's, it's worn down with every decision you make over the course of the day. And this is why rules are so much in, more important than guidelines. If you say, I avoid chocolate 90% of the time and I have it 10% of the time, well, that might be a good guideline. That might be a good North Star to shoot for. I can't argue with that. But I, what I will tell you is that every time there's a big hairy chocolate bar at Starbucks, you're going to have to make another food decision because you don't know if this is part of the 90% or part of the 10%. Whereas if I say, I only ever have chocolate on the last Saturday of the month, by, by default, I know that I don't have to make any decisions until the last Saturday of the month. So r rules are more important than guidelines and character trumps willpower. Uh, this is great. And it can be applied for things like uh, technology addiction too, right? Because people who, and I'll, I admit I'm kind of guilty of this, people who check their phone a little too often, <laughs> you, could, uh, you could use this types of tools and these algorithms to really sort of create ways for you to avoid checking that phone first thing in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Any type of a behavioral economy where you can define very clear rules. And the, the acid test is, can you create a rule where 10 people could follow you around all month long and they'd all agree whether you followed it or not, right? So, so I will never engage in more than one hour of screen time after 8 p.m. again is a rule for your technology addiction that you could have people follow around by. Um, if you said, well, um, I'm just going to cut down on my technology time, that's not something that people could follow you around and, and agree upon. So you have to make it very, very, very measurable. And yeah. speaking of measurable, in the book, you talk about the value of measuring your weight every day. Now, I'm a person who loves measurement. I get into very uh, sometimes heated debates with people who don't like measurement. Do you mind going through what you mean there for everybody listening? Yeah, I take a lot of heat for this because the common cultural wisdom is the idea that you could get too obsessed with the scale and that it's bad for you. So I had the good fortune to trade consultations with Stephen Covey about 15 years ago. I, I wanted leadership advice for the company I was running and he wanted marketing advice for his, his website. And one of the things he taught me, he he gave me an analogy of making small corrections with constant measurement all the time. He said, a plane that flies from New York to Los Angeles only hits, hits on the runway 3,500 miles away within just a couple of inches of its target because it's constantly off course and constantly measuring and making small adjustments. And it's, it turns out that it's a lot easier to make small adjustments than big adjustments. It's also a lot easier to clean up small messes than big messes. When I got divorced, I noticed that if I put things away right away, that the big messes never occurred. 
but, but it, initially I wasn't doing that. I was just kind of waiting until there was a big mess and then I had to clean it up. And I, I wouldn't want to get on an airplane where the pilot says, you know, it's too upsetting to me to look at the instruments. I, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to kind of point the plane in the right direction and we'll get there some way, one way or another. Maybe I'll check it when we're supposed to be over Chicago. If we're over Alaska, who cares? I, I'm not getting on that plane. I, I want the pilot to check in the measurement all the time. I'm not getting in the car without scanning the speedometer, without being able to see through the windshield. I'm not certainly going to put a piece of cardboard over the car and try to drive around blind. These numbers exist whether you look at, look at them or not. It turns out that the problem is that our food monsters or our pigs use the scale as an opportunity to binge no matter what it says. So the scale has gone down a couple of pounds and the pig says, hey, you've lost enough weight, you could afford a binge. Or the scale is up a couple of pounds and the pig says, oh, you're pathetic, it doesn't matter, we might as well just be a happy fat person. And the cure for all of that is to first of all take hundreds of measurements, so no particular measurement means much to you. You use this site like trendweight.com, which calculates a trend over time and kind of factors out all of the noise like did you have a bowel movement and how salty was your dinner and what time did you have dinner what time of day did you measure yourself and and all of that and you can see the trend coming down over time or going up over time if you're having trouble so i i'm very much in favor of people using the scale and measuring every day once in a while i run into people particularly people who've had bulimia in the past they seem to be too frightened of the scale and you can do okay without it but um, I think it's a really good tool and I don't think we should be foregoing it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And that was one of the reasons why I want to have you come on the show because I, I'm a big fan of measuring anything you want to improve. That can be anything from sleep to my heart rate during exercise. And so that's, that's absolutely necessary. And I think- we, we, we improve what we measure. Yeah. Exactly. I think- Yeah. It's wrongly attributed to Peter Drucker. What gets measured gets managed. I think it's actually Lord Kelvin that said it, but really, it's it's, um, it, it's in a very very good quote. That's for sure. I didn't know that. So, Glenn, uh, final four questions for you. What is health to you? <sighs> health is my ability to love and to work. He health sustains my. Um, ability to be present and connect with the people that I love and the people that I want to love. And it sustains my ability to make a contribution through my work to channel my energies into, um, into improving the world and myself and helping the people around me improve in the ways that they want to improve. So health is my ability to do that. And if I, if my body doesn't sustain me in that ability, then it's unfortunate and I feel sad. What is your top trick for enhancing your focus? I journal in the morning and I usually wake up in the morning with a list of 20 things that I want to get done that day. And I try to prioritize them. But what I really ask myself is if there were only one thing that I got done today, what would be the biggest win? And I make sure that I get that one thing done at all costs. What's your favorite book on high performance? Might be Maximum Achievement by Brian Tracy. It's a great book. I, I actually haven't read that one so i'll have to pick that one up oh you should you should absolutely so glenn before we get to the last question i just want to acknowledge you for writing this great book with really i found it very easy to follow and very uh tactical in the sense that you can take some of these things action them right away and find it very useful in your everyday life so thank you for writing this great book but uh, Last question, and this is kind of the catch-all. Where can people find out more about you, Glenn? At the website, neverbingeagain.com. If you click the big red free bonus button, you can get a free copy of the book in Kindle, Nook, or PDF format. And what I've also done, because this is a very weird philosophy when we talk about it in theory, I mean, I know that some of your listeners are thinking, so there's this psychologist, and he sounds like he's sophisticated, but he's got this pig inside him, and you know, Boomer, what the hell are you doing with this guy on your show? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it sounds like it's really harsh, but it's actually a very compassionate, life-giving, self-esteem enhancing process because people take back their power and they take back control. And I recorded a whole bunch of full-length sessions for free that you can hear people's despair and feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness transform into 
hope, enthusiasm, and power again. And so I, I want you to hear, hear, hear how it's actually done. You'll also get that you go to Never Binge Again and click the big red free bonus button and sign up for that list. And finally, you will get a set of food plan starter templates, which are a set of hypothetical rules. You have to take responsibility and alter them for your own benefit. But we've set them up for um, ketogenic and point counters and vegans and low carb and high carb and just about any dietary philosophy you can imagine. We've set up a set of starter plans for you. It's all at neverbingeagain.com. Click the big red button. You can also contact me through that site if you want to. Glenn, thank you so much for taking the time today. This has been an absolute pleasure. And I know I've learned a lot. And I hope all of the listeners out there, you got something out of this too. But thank you so much. Thank you. It was great to be here. Thanks, Boomer. To all the superhumans out there, have an absolutely epic day. Superhumans, before you go, can I ask two favors? Did you enjoy that episode? If so, can you send me an email at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com? Provide any feedback, positive or negative. I would love to hear from you. And for those of you who have really taken advantage of that, you know I respond to each email. Secondly, if you did enjoy the episode, can you head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, any one of your favorite podcast listening platforms, and give Decoding Superhuman a five-star rating. It would really be appreciated. And then finally, for those of you who are looking at taking an informed approach to health, head on over to decodingsuperhuman.com. Check out what we have going on over there. And if you want to schedule a free 15-minute discovery call with me, you're going to have that option. Superhumans, have an absolutely epic day. And remember, as always, choose health. Thank you.